Okay, it is 10.30 plus a couple of minutes. And I'm sure some people will drift in over the next few, but uh, let's get started because we have, I keep saying it, but it remains true, a very full session. Um, I will try to remember to make this announcement again at the end of this session, but in case I forget, right after we finish here, before we eat lunch, we are all meeting for a GEC 25 group photo that will be outside on the uh, back deck here, so back into the uh, dining area and walk out through the glass doors. We'll take a picture. Everybody's presence will be in document. Oh, the p I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Ivan. Ivan will take a picture. And uh, everybody's presence will be documented in all our great and glorious beauty, and then we can eat lunch. Okay, so uh, right after this session, the group photo. So in this session, I want to give you a little bit of an update on uh, some future directions for Genie, relationship to other uh, upcoming programs, and then some specific uh, project updates. Uh, this is mostly you know, future pointers, pointers into uh, other discussions that we're having at this GEC or pointers into uh, future uh, upcoming projects like the ones you've been hearing about uh, so far this morning. And after that, we're going to have uh, a set of uh, plenary demonstrations. We'll be highlighting the capabilities of software-defined exchanges uh, that are being built both under uh, Genie's Aegis uh, under NSF Aegis, under other uh, efforts, and their abilities to interact, their abilities to uh, set up and control software-defined wide area networks. So the, fuse, the first uh, future pointer uh, comes at the bottom of this slide and says we're going to talk a little bit right now about some future directions for Genie. This is essentially a sampling of community feedback uh, that uh, the Genie Project Office uh, solicited about what should, what should this uh, community be looking at uh, for future capabilities, either built into Genie or related. We'll have a bit more of a discussion uh, in the second half of the Looking Ahead session uh, this afternoon, but this is uh, the start of really a long-term uh, discussion because this is a, a huge topic. So I, I think you've gotten the impression that we are you know, in an exciting moment in the development of, of mid-scale infrastructure uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, and that this community has an important role to play uh, in this time of transition. We have, you know, we've heard about power and tip-off and the looking beyond uh, the internet uh, sequence of workshops. There's a there's a vision forming, and we need to help form it. While we're doing that, we need to, you know, assure the sustainment and support of specific infrastructure of interest, and we need to make sure that that interest um, represents the appropriate underlayment, the appropriate platform uh, for, new research for new research initiatives that are coming, and I've apparently lost the power of speech. Um, so, but you know, this group has a big role to play in conceptualizing, designing, and developing the research infrastructure platforms of tomorrow. When we asked you uh, and, and others in the Gini community who aren't here, essentially, what were some important uh, future directions for Gini? They essentially um, bubbled into uh, three categories, and this is looking sort of from uh, nearer term to farther term. Uh, one is making Gini itself better, you know, various expanded um, and improved support for both research and educational purposes. Uh, sort of within that category, but looking a, a bit more afield, and uh, I know that uh, Rick McGear will talk about this uh, at, at some length, or as much length as will allow him uh, during <laughs> this afternoon's session. Uh, you know, ad advancing uh, the unique edge cloud capabilities uh, that are instantiated in Genie, but that need uh, additional development and additional scale. And then the third area, uh, that people responded in was sort of in the general area of uh, leading uh, future research cyber infrastructure, uh, making sure that uh, the platform 
and the concepts that support interoperation and connectivity uh, among different uh, cyber infrastructure systems, test beds, platforms uh, are in place and making sure to represent that in an open architecture that allows other projects to you know pick and choose from the concepts without basically being you know genie. I have some specifics I'm going to go through very quickly on the next few slides in each of these spaces and then as I said we'll sample that uh, but we will badly subsample it uh, this afternoon uh, in the looking ahead session but I simply wanted to point out a bunch of the the ideas that resonated with you know significant fractions of the community. Um, in the improving Genie space, uh, first on everybody's list uh, was refreshing or updating existing rack resources which have been around for a while and are uh, not the most current uh, hardware. There's a fair amount of interest in enhancing the computation ability at individual sites, simply being able to stand up uh, more machines, whether those are virtual or physical, uh, at individual sites. Uh, in a different dimension of expansion, there's great interest in having more sites and easier ways to bring up more sites, including some sort of bring your own rack or bring your own resources model. Uh, stitching and making sure that stitching is uh, more universal and reliable was uh, one of the, the big hits, uh, as was more opportunities for high speed, we're talking you know, 10 gig and up uh, connectivity and options for guaranteed bandwidth, which we don't really support in any meaningful way today in Gini. There's concern that you know, Gini is a great success. Uh, there's concern that we are essentially full. Uh, it's, we're not always full, but there are times when people who are trying to obtain a significant number of resources uh, run into trouble. So we'd like to have either more resources or strategies that help with resource management or both, but to address the oversubscription problem. And uh, there's concern about uh, reliability and software update strategies. I heard more of this um, in an exogeny context because their update strategies are a little different, but this is a, a general problem. And if you look down you know, at the bottom here, these are different and potentially competing dimensions. So it's not clear that you can do you know, all of these things at once, uh, even, even with unlimited budget, which I don't believe we have. So in the space of moving beyond how do we make Genie as we know and love it, <coughs> excuse me, bigger and better, and thinking about how do we re-envision or how, how do we remake Genie to be more capable? Um, some of the areas that got a lot of interest were uh, having software-defined uh, radio capability at some of Genie wireless sites, uh, more or better models for network programmability. Uh, these include either more recent uh, versions of OpenFlow or uh, pathways to programmability through something like P4 or GPDK uh, in Genie. And there are you know, little bits of explorations happening in some of these spaces. In fact, when you see the demos uh, just in uh, half an hour or so, uh, we'll be using uh, an OpenFlow 1.3 capability there, but it's not widely deployed. So that's another opportunity. Um, uh, more advanced ways to manage the interoperation uh, between different uh, interoperating test beds uh, that uh, Genie is working with. Uh, more network aware tools for uh, the support of interactions among uh, I believe the distributed cloud that is Genie, resources that are on specific campuses, and the emerging wireless edge. Um, and then uh, some interest in tool improvements for licensed software. So that was, you know, one is Genie, two is Genie Plus, three is uh, leadership of, of uh, new and emerging capabilities. What can Genie be doing to lead uh, interoperability and research cyber infrastructure. And the, the topics of interest here turned out to be around uh, programmability uh, and resource control, uh, really focusing at bridging 
uh, emerging wireless edge capabilities, and this is you know, with an obvious look towards power, but other related projects as well, uh, and network core, cyber physical systems support, emphasis on uh, both low latency in the network, uh, but also the diversity of different sources of res uh, different types of resources uh, and how to have a, a control patterns that uh, help them to interoperate. You know, how do we program things that we're not accustomed to programming and how do we program a lot of different things uh, within one, uh, one infrastructure umbrella? Uh, programmable and uh, low friction, think science DMZ uh, or campus cyber infrastructure sorts of efforts uh, for unique and high value resources at specific, let's say campuses. Um, and the, the tools and the infrastructure support to uh, help out with uh, experiment design and repeatability. Uh, we've hinted at a lot of these things in Genie. We've made progress in some of these areas, but uh, these are all huge areas for, for future effort. So like I said, we'll be talking some about this uh, this afternoon, and these are things that should be, I, I hope, in everybody's uh, mind as we look forward. A reminder of timeline and upcoming events. This is the, uh, the advertising uh, section of the talk. Uh, you are at an interesting point in the evolution of Genie, where we are looking at separating out the future management of Genie from being a, you know, something driven by the Genie project office uh, to having a, a two-part management structure. One is through the uh, Future Cyber Infrastructure Consortium which has had its first meeting, but not yet its second. So uh, its, uh, it, its future path and, frankly, its level of success is not yet well understood. Uh, right after, I said right before lunch, uh, we'll have a, a report from uh, the folks at uh, Renzi who have been leading uh, the preparations for the next uh, future cyber infrastructure meeting. And then Ken already told you about uh, the tip-off solicitation and the relationship between this uh, future cyber infrastructure consortium, which will provide some uh, vision, and the, the tip-off office. You really can't say tip-off office, can you? <laughs> the, the, the office that will uh, be in charge of both the day-to-day uh, -day management and providing some, uh, some vision and organization for the community. Uh, and I think, honestly, I just said this stuff, but... Um, Come to the consortium update session. Actually, you can't help it. You're already sitting in the consortium update session. It just, you know, comes in 45 minutes. And you know, think about tip-off and think about what this community ought to be doing to support that effort. In the meantime, there's a bunch of good work that's going on. This is mostly behind-the-scenes work uh, to prepare uh, Genie, both the uh, physical infrastructure and the management processes uh, for transition to a new office, and there have been some serious successes very early uh, this year. Uh, people may have noticed, uh, I wish you hadn't, but we did have a, you know, one or two hiccups uh, with the move from uh, the GPO-hosted sites to uh, Amazon Web Services uh, for the Genie Portal to Clearinghouse, but that, you know, after a day or so of hiccups, is, is running very nicely, uh, and we are, you know, not managing unique resources uh, anymore associated with uh, what I think people perceive as the most central uh, capabilities uh, of, of managing Genie. With that, not at the same time, but about a week apart, uh, we also transitioned the primary responsibility for operations of Genie infrastructure uh, from a team at the Genie project office to the distributed operations team, which is a, a set of half a dozen, Heidi? Uh, half a dozen different groups uh, that are collaboratively managing Genie operations now, and that seems to be going very smoothly as well. So these, both of these things, each of these things in, is in itself uh, a very big deal. Uh, as we've been doing that, we've also been supporting uh, a bunch of network reconfiguration that's in concert uh, with uh, AL2S uh, updates in Internet 2. Uh, you will see uh, this month uh, the first new uh, racks in the uh, US Ignite rack configuration. I think we're going to three 
cities for start for them. You have to three in three cities. Um, and one thing that will be visible to some experimenters is the uh, decommissioning of the GPO managed identity provider. This is a functionality now offered uh, by NCSA for the general community, and it's a, a system we simply do not need to have uh, uniquely for Genie. Uh, for those of you who uh, authenticate to Genie through your uh, campus-based uh, identity provider, you, there's no change. For those of you who are using the GPO-based one, you'll get instructions on how to move your identity over to NCSA's provider. It takes, oh, I don't know, three minutes. So you know, when those instructions come, please, uh, please follow them. And if you want to know more details, uh, the transition and roundtable sessions uh, today and tomorrow uh, will be providing some of those details. Genie Community Events. This is GEC 25, for those of you who aren't aware. Um, there was a time when we did everything in GECs, but we've sort of broadened our system of events to cover uh, both learning about Genie, which primarily happens at Genie Regional Workshops. There was one here yesterday. We often couple them with GECs, but we also have them independently of GECs. Uh, well, you know what? I left the specifics off of this slide. I'm sorry. We'll get to the next one. Um, if you're interested in hosting a regional workshop, you can send mail to help at genie.net, or you can talk to Violet or Ibrahim, who are cleverly are seated right next to each other. Um, we, are, we have the host for the next uh, GRW in May, but I think uh, we haven't scheduled the one after that yet. Um, we have a event, Genie Nice, that's primarily about using Genie, which we hold in the fall. Uh, the last one was held in December uh, in Irvine. And yes, it was still fall. It was early December. <laughs> and Genie Engineering Conferences are about uh, building and improving Genie. And of course, both NICE and uh, GECs include uh, the demo session because we just can't give that one up. Uh, we've also moved a bunch of the uh, reporting on Genie research out of Genie-specific locales and into uh, more general uh, community locales. So. Uh, the CNERT conference is a, uh, I'm sorry, the CNERT workshop is a workshop for reporting uh, research on test beds in general. Uh, the last one was held in conjunction with Infocom uh, this April, uh, last April. Uh, our last regional workshop was at Clemson uh, and the one here yesterday. And we hold a, a summer school uh, each summer uh, in conjunction with our, our, our research collaborators in the EU. Here's the one with the upcoming events. So the next CNERC workshop will be in Atlanta, May 1st, uh, in conjunction with Infocom. The next Genie Regional Workshop, so if you have Texan friends or friends from sort of that area of the country who ought to be learning about Genie, uh, will be at Texas A&M May 22nd, and we're planning three more uh, this year. And the Texas A&M uh, workshop kicks off a week-long camp for those who are interested in going into a little more depth and really jump-starting their, uh, their research projects. The next Genie Nice will be October, I want to say it's October either 9th or 10th, but it's the, it's the first day, the workshop day of ICNP uh, 2017 in Toronto. So we've got a, a, a full slate of events scheduled. Uh, the Genie monthly webinar series uh, con uh, continues. The next, we're taking March off uh, because of the GEC, but the uh, next scheduled webinar is on uh, programming the data plane with P4, and that's April 21st. Uh, you can also see uh, all of the uh, previous recorded webinars that are available uh, from the Genie Wiki, or if you just want to jump right to Ben Newton's uh, YouTube channel, you can do that. Uh, a quick community report, and then I will uh, defer to the demos. Uh, this is my favorite chart. Uh, sometime in February, we surpassed 10,000 uh, users uh, of Genie. This is you know, tremendously exciting to watch this growth. Uh, for some reason, we continue to miss Mississippi, uh, but otherwise we have um, users in, in every state in the Union and on uh, five continents. There are 
uh, somewhat over 330 uh, published papers uh, in the Genie bibliography. Uh, I'm sure some are missing because these are only the ones that people tell me about or that I managed to find out of coincidence. Um, if yours is missing, uh, please let me know uh, and we'll make sure it gets in there. And these folks are doing a lot of different things. Uh, networking and distributed computing research, I think as we sort of initially anticipated for Genie, but uh, on-demand science, uh, locavore, uh, data and real-time integration, uh, dynamic infrastructure, and very heavy uh, use in the classroom. Uh, we have dozens of classes using, in G using Genie. Uh, this year, again, these are just the ones we know about, but there are, are at least 1,400 students uh, using Genie in 47 classes uh, this <coughs> academic year. Uh, this afternoon, in the international part of the Looking Ahead session, we'll hear a bunch from the, some, of the, some of our partners who are building, uh, collaborating, uh, future internet distributed cloud test beds. Uh, this is the map I've shown for a long time of the parts of the world where uh, this sort of activity is underway. But we are, we're continuing to build you know, a multinational group of collaborators. I'm sorry to rush through that. I'm eager to get to the demos. Uh, and then the, you know, the last thing uh, that we're going to do before the demos is uh, present the results of the Genie Experimenter Contest. Uh, Shannon Champion is sitting in the back there. Uh, Shannon, do you want to come up and we can do this together? You know, it's not fair because I, I have the checks, but, you know, Shannon wrote them. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but we do want to thank... Um, Matrix Integration for uh, sponsoring this contest, which was uh, really a lot of fun. I also want to make sure to thank our, uh, I think when we do it down here, I'm going to set up. I uh, want to thank our judging team, uh, Freda, who, who led it, but uh, Freda, Shannon, uh, Abraham, and, and Mike Zink uh, did the judging. So the winners, um, in second place, uh, the team from Clemson, that's Christian, John, King, Lou, Junaid, Casey, and Richard. Uh, I think at least several of you are here, but could you come up and get your uh, certificates and your checks? I, I should mention, by the way, that um, on both of the teams uh, that we're giving prizes to, the faculty members uh, have, have waived their, uh, their cash prizes and it's going to the students, which I don't see. And a logistically simpler uh, team <laughs> takes first prize, uh, Dimitri and Prasad from the University of Missouri. Don't forget the upcoming events. Uh, CNERT, May 1st, Regional Workshop and Summer Camp, uh, uh, May 22nd through 26th, Jeannie Nice, October 10th through 13th in Toronto. And we are now going to see uh, a set of demonstrations of software defined exchanges and software defined wide area networking. And Heidi, I think, will 
introduce us. Wow, the team is quickly assembling up here at the table. <laughs> So this is a, an exciting demo, at least from my point of view, um, because it's the first time we've really um, been able to combine SDN and SDX into a, a system that has reached multiple SDX exchanges, um, multiple different kinds of core networks, multiple different kinds of endpoints, including Genie Racks, and we're hoping that it all continues to work for the next half an hour. So let me just log in here. Okay, so um, the team just briefly, uh, Joe Membretti from Starlight is going to lead us off. And there are a lot of other names here. Everybody who's on this slide actually did something to make this demo work. So um, we're just the folks who are presenting it and pulling it together. Um, Tom Lehman from Max and Wix. Um, <laughs> Russ Clark, who seems to be <laughs> actively getting his part, which we assigned him this morning during breakfast. Um, although Georgia Tech's been very active participating in this all along. Um, and Ali Sidney, who's going to show a combination demo of OpenFlow and SDX at the, at the uh, end of this. So with that, Joe, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Heidi, and thank you for all of your fabulous work on this uh, project. We had quite a team, and as Heidi said, there's a number of people not mentioned here um, doing a number of projects. Uh, this is actually more than one demo. It's several demos, and that's one of the points. Um, the key words here are dynamic, uh, software-defined, wide area network. Uh, most networks today are static. That's the state of the art. Um, but people don't want static. They want to be able to dynamically change things. Um, the the software-defined everything revolution that's happening, it was referred to by a number of... Uh, uh, previous presentations, um, is infiltrating all parts of networks. This is going to focus on layer two. So there's a mostly layer two uh, capabilities, and specifically layer two across the WAN. That's the focus of uh, the series of demonstrations, because we want to show some capabilities that simply do not exist in today's environments. So. Um, we're going to talk about the research motivations, some specific research motivations, collaborating across WAN domains. That's another important point. There are some people making great claims about their production SDNs, but it's single domain. We have to work in an area that's multi-domain that's very different and it's much more challenging. We're going to look ahead and then we're going to do some live demos. So research, some key issues. Today, almost all networks provide for a one-size-fits-all service. That's obsolete. Uh, one size never fits all, especially in a technology domain. Such services are suboptimal for many types of applications and services. They simply cannot be done on traditional networks. Uh, TCP, by the way, is an antique protocol. 40 years? Come on. Future networks must provide differentiation, and one way to do this is slicing. And this demonstration will show how um, programmable WAN networking uh, made possible by Genie tools and capabilities can address these issues. So collaboration uh, challenges. Uh, on today's networks, even r &E networks, it's difficult to do certain things. And we've picked two examples here. Um, one is if you're a scientist and you want to send an extremely large file from Kansas to California, you simply can't do it. And we continually run into scientists who are sending their files uh, through FedEx and through the mail. Simply can't be done on the networks. Um, another is um, large-scale streaming. Uh, 4K media, which is 4,000 pixels horizontal and um, 2,000 vertical. 8K, which can be 8,000 vertical, 8,000 horizontal. 
It uh, doesn't have a, a proper standard format, but some of these can be uh, as many as 60 gig uh, across the WAN. Today's networks can't do it. So currently, almost all networks are based on statically provisioned resources. We talked about that. And we need policies also because you simply can't open up the network to anybody in Sundry to stream uh, 80 gig or 100 gig. Uh, so you need to express policies. You need to have uh, orchestrators who understand what resources are there and how they're allocated, how they should be allocated within that policy framework. Solution using programmable networks, slicing the networks to segment different resources within a policy context for different types of usage capabilities. In other words, moving away from the one-size-fits-all network to a highly sliceable network where different the usage allocations uh, map to uh, the resource uh, requirements of the applications and services. So we have these things called Genie SDXs, and you'll hear a lot about that. Uh, they're going to be showcased here. And um, new hardware and uh, software APIs to actually do the signaling uh, uh, in accordance with uh, emerging tools, including OpenFlow 1.3. Uh, Genie and uh, ESNet control planes integrated into the SDXs. And then a variety of other different components, including data transfer nodes, science DMZs, the NSF uh, cyber, um, campus cyber infrastructure uh, sites, uh, commercial services, and others. In other words, we want to map everything into this, um, this fabric. And the highlight is the dynamic uh, software-defined WAN provisioning, which is becoming, uh, this is a little overstated. It's not becoming a production feature. It's migrating its slow way from experiment to prototype, hopefully to production. Looking ahead, um, Collaborators uh, with new commercial and uh, international resources um, can join uh, Genie Experimenters via Dynamic WANs. We want this to be international, so uh, yes, Paul, I uh, want to connect you, and, and Dong Yum Kim is in the audience, and we'll, we'll hear about uh, some of the internationals, and um, uh, Ruslan is here, too. Uh, domain experts can collaborate with experimenters in Genie and others in these uh, broader fabrics, and then campuses also can join in. Now, here are some SDXs that are emerging. There's one in uh, LA, and we've do been doing a lot of good work with John Hess there and Scenic. Um, one is in Sunnyvale, one is in Seattle. There's a couple at Starlight, uh, one in Atlanta that um, uh, Russ Clark is going to talk about. There's one here at FIU. And, of course, uh, Tom Lehman's in uh, Washington, D.C. There's some emerging in Asia, and there's some emerging in Europe. There's a prototype in Amsterdam uh, done by SurfNet. There's one at Ghent that's quite good, and, and we're using that to uh, interconnect test beds. Um, Paul Mueller is going to do one in Germany. Um, another tool that deserves mention is uh, something called NSI which is an API to control planes. Uh, we had many discussions about how no one's going to use, everybody's not going to use the same control plane, so you need an API to do interfaces to many. This is one called NSI, which is coming out of a standards group. And then related to that is something called MACAN, uh, which RNP did in Brazil, and it's a very nice overlay uh, of tools on NSI. These are the automated goals today. So this is a fabric that exists today that's interoperable that people can use. And then um, uh, just to reference uh, some of the N, uh, RNP work being done with DTN. So DTN is an appliance for large-scale transfers. So if you do want to do a large-scale transfer, uh, DTNs can help. Um, we're not going to show this as a demo, but we want to refer to it. Uh, we did some large-scale file transfers between DTNs in California and at Starlight um, very successfully uh, with uh, dynamically provisioned uh, VLANs. And this is a reference to uh, ESNN's, uh, ESNet's uh, SDN fabric, and um, Internet2 is also doing uh, SDN overlay. So we're going to do some demos of this. Um, one is uh, SDN matching data flows to paths. So the SDX at Starlight will coordinate with uh, the MAX SDX and the SOX SDX to select the best path, which, by the way, is not 
necessarily the shortest path, right? So everybody uses uh, open shortest path first. It's not necessarily the best. Um, cross ESNet and AL2S for transferring large files. The resource requests are um, via the Genie uh, Aggregate Manager, OESS, Oscars, uh, and uh, Software-controlled uh, uh, paths uh, at these SDX will be used for best application performance. And uh, as a result, um, files will be transferred over um, what could be called super channels, um, because those super channels will be established to bypass the normal uh, paths. So this is the recipe. Um, you have your app. Use SDN to find the best path, you establish the path, you send the files, and then you put the resources back in the pool. And this is a topology uh, for uh, the demonstrations. Uh, second demonstration, SDX for international connections, um, including uh, with streaming video. So one, some of our collaborators are at the Electronic Visualization Lab, University of Illinois at Chicago, and um, we'll be streaming some live uh, video uh, from that lab into this venue. So applic matching application demands such as bandwidth and delay to specifically engineered paths, again, using the resource tools for allocation. and um, uh, streaming into uh, into AMPATH. The second demonstration, again, it's a very similar recipe. You want to send a live, uh, high-capacity, uh, long-term stream. You find the path, you establish the path, you send the files, you return the path resources to topology. And this is the uh, topology used. Third demo is um, SDX software-defined services. So software-defined everything. In fact, I, I heard someone use the term software-defined software. I don't know what that is. I'm kind of curious. Uh, so experimenters will create the services that combine Genie and industry resources with policy-based SDX and SDN control. Resources at InstaGenie Racks, Amazon Web Services, Wix, uh, SOX SDX, and multiple core resources. The resources requests and orchestrations are via the same tools, and then it combines layer two and layer three resources in this instance. And this is um, the uh, SDX software defined services. So that's the summary, and now uh, let's go right to the demos. And uh, let me mention one more uh, bit that didn't get in here that we've been working on, uh, we've been working with Mark Lyonnais and his research group at Siena to do some measurements on this, but we didn't quite have all the space to showcase that. So with that, let's go. Um, the slides will be posted on the website too if you want to look at all the people we gave thanks to for helping pull this together. Okay, so now we're going to move to the live part of the demo. Um, oh, the first two demos, demo one and demo two. Uh, so over there, you'll see the map of the topology that we're using uh, for demo one, which is a, a combination of endpoints at Starlight um, or at Max or at Georgia Tech. You'll notice that we're mixing um, DTN nodes, which came from the ESNet and the, uh, that side of the world, with compute nodes on GenieRacks and InstaGenieRacks, and later on we'll show other um, other endpoints we can use as well. Oops, don't want to rename the network. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so this is um, Juniper, which is a, a nice scripting tool because we're talking to DTN nodes and we're talking to GenieRacks. Um, it's, it can be used in either type of environment, and uh, Fei Ye did a great job putting this together. And what we're going to do is just run through. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, demo two, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't believe we've been doing this for two weeks. but. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to run through demo one. Uh, we're going to start up uh, transferring four one gig files from the Institute at Max to the DTN node at Starlight. So first we're just going to clean up files because um, they could be left around here. 
Um, whoops, I'm going to hit the wrong thing. Why is this not happening? Oh, it's because I'm hitting the wrong button. Sorry. There. Okay. So we'll remove uh, the old versions of the files, waiting for them to go away. SSH into the, the max PC node. and start transferring over the ESnet link. So the application is picking here the path that it wants to use. And to start off, we, we're going to use these VLANs that we've set up, <coughs> excuse me, in 1663 to 1720 uh, that are available to start this file transfer. Um, what Jupyter is showing you here, the little star on the side shows that the uh, transfer is beginning and when it turns back to a number, um, then it should be set. Okay, we're set up the receiver. So now we're going to start up the file transfer. Go ahead. Okay, so this could take about a minute. Let me just scroll it down while we're waiting for it to complete. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. It's actually a very nice scripting tool for managing science workflows for domain science. And what we're doing is we're applying that uh, to network management because it's a nice uh, um, uh, framework within which you can do your scripts and then uh, ideally use them in other things. Which does not seem to be completing. <laughs> What's not connected? Oh, that's strange. I don't know why. I've got the Ethernet connected here. <sighs> Start over? All right. I'll start over. We'll see. It always happens. Yep, live demos. All right. That looks better. Nope, that's not working. Just kill the other one. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think there's any point in trying to debug this in front of everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we have been running this demo for a couple of weeks. And, she's working. and it was working, you know, this morning. Um, of course, the, a black cat did walk across our path yesterday when we were leaving the demo uh, room at 6 p.m. So um, I don't know. Is there any reason to try demo two or is demo right. two? All right. Let's see if this one works. So this is. Uh, the second type of demo, we have exogeny um, racks connected in this topology here. Um, this is also the demo where uh, our friends at RNP down in Brazil connected their SDN domain into the network. And um, folks at the EVL um, at UCSD connected into this uh, multi-domain SDX. So let's see if this one will work. Um, <laughs> this is four gig, two gigabit files because Exogeny Rex have 10 gig interface instead of a one gig interface. So you can uh, transfer more data, presuming that it's okay with the policy of the Rex. So no, this isn't going to, oh, that one's finished. All right, perhaps this is going to work. Ah, good. Okay. We'll start the receiver at FIU. So the, this is the Genie Rack that's actually sitting uh, at the FIU campus that we're using for this. We'll start the file transfer up at Starlight. So we're using the same DTN node. And because these are larger files, these are four times two gig files, it will take longer than the first one would have taken if it had succeeded. And if this one succeeds, I'm never going to hear the end of it from Ilya. <laughs> okay, so.
Now we're sending the files, all four files in parallel. Um, we configured this to use two gigabits out of the 10 gigabits because there are a lot of different experimenters using the exogenie racks. It's not just genie people. Um, so we didn't want to use up all the band bandwidth there. Um, another thing to notice is that exogenie racks have two different sizes of VMs. You can have a small VM or a large VM, which refers to the amount of resources that are allocated to them. The large VMs are better. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Only two that I know of. <laughs> sorry. So we're, we're yeah, using the large. The yeah. Yeah. So we're using the large. Um, they also have bare metal. Okay, we're using the extra large. <laughs> Just exogenie is awesome. I, I don't really need to go on with the rest of the demo, do I? Okay. So now, whoops, ah, sorry. Okay, so woohoo. Oh. All four files were transferred. You can see that we used about two gig here. Uh, and you can see the round trip time on these files. And that is the end of demo two. So I apologize about demo one. You'll just have to trust me that it did work. Um, and uh, the other piece we want to show you here is the live video from the EVL, which is going to use this same setup. And let me just connect it. So Joe, Joe mentioned streaming video, uh, which you can do because who cares if you can do a bunch of big files, right? That's not live. Um, of course, there's a lot of interesting big files that come from people's collaborators. Oh, and of course, this is, sorry, I have to log in to it first. Yeah, yeah this is aimed at large-scale streaming, not the sort of things that you see now, but something that could be a 3D movie that goes into uh, uh, a supercomputing center to a, a science center. Okay, so I apologize that it's a little bit small, um, but that's the streaming 4K video coming from the, the um, Electronic Visualization Laboratory. Um, I tried to make it bigger, but it just stays flat. Yeah, I mean, it's the software. We can, we can turn it into a tape. <laughs> <laughs> Such a supportive team we have here. <laughs> okay, so that's that can, nice. that, nice. this is, uh, also brought about because of the SDX that's allowing us to connect those endpoints. Um, thank you to the, to the FIU folks and the AMPATH folks who configured the VLAN extensions so that we could show you this in this room here and so that we could reach Brazil. Um, and we look forward to you coming up with lots of interesting variations on pieces you can combine to run your own uh, demonstrations. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tom who's gonna give you a little bit more of a view into the software. Where is this? So I'm Tom Lehman of the University of Maryland, Max. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of the SDXs in particular, Wix which is the Washington International Exchange. And that's a production facility jointly run by Internet2 and Max. It's in McLean, Virginia in a level three facility. And um, it's, a, it's currently um, you know, utilized for typical exchange point types of functions, which is bringing in various international connections and domestic connections and doing very basic exchange point things that production exchange points do today, which is basically layer two cross connects and they're typically manually provisioned, although the GRNOC does run an OSCARS instance. For people familiar with OSCARS, that's a, a dynamic VLAN layer two provisioning system developed by DOE and ESNet. So um, we do have some ability on the production facility to do some programmatic things or some GUI driven things where we can create very basic VLAN cross connects across there and that's utilized. But what we wanted to do, we wanted to turn Wix into a true software defined exchange. We wanted to do not only be able to programmatically interact with the layer two cross connects, but we also wanted to extend the type of things that you could do across Wix. And our vision for uh, extending that was 
we not only want to provision what's the layer two VLANs on Wix, we also want to be able to provision the things that are attached to Wix. We want to create an environment where people can bring things to an exchange point, bring a resource to an exchange point, and include that as things you can dynamically make happen at the exchange point. So what we have done here is Max has a direct connect to Amazon, which is in the U.S. East region, which is at the Equinix facility in Ashburn, Virginia. So we've taken a block of VLANs from that direct connect, and we've expressed these at Wix. So from a Wix perspective, it has a direct connect to Amazon directly connected. And um, so what you can do there is now you can think about programmatically controlling not only the VLANs on, on Wix, but also the, uh, some interconnects into Amazon. So if you have resources in Amazon, what we can do is we can basically allow you to programmatically come into Wix and say, I want to get a cross-connect across Wix. I like to have that dynamically attached to a virtual private cloud inside Amazon. Um, so the way we did that from a software stack perspective is that we leveraged the Oscars instance which was already there. And we have something we call Stack V, which is basically orchestration software. It understands a lot of APIs. It can talk to Oscars. It can talk to OESS. It can talk to OpenStack. It can talk to AWS APIs. So basically it has intelligence to go down all these APIs and bring it up. It's a model-driven uh, system that it can understand all these resources underneath it and do things in an integrated manner. So that basically gives us the mechanisms for people to come in and programmatically say, give me a cross-connect across Wix, connect it to this VLAN, uh, make all the magic happen so it goes to a very specific VPC inside of Amazon and attached to whatever specific resources a user might have. And you'll see when Ali does the next demo, you'll see that that was a part of, uh, this, of the demo where they would basically kind of hijack flows going across the network, throw them towards Wix, dump them into some resources inside Amazon so you might be able to do some specialized things. So, um, so what we did is we also wanted to make this part of the Genie community. So that's why we're calling it a Genie-enabled SDX. So on top of that, we put a Genie aggregate manager interface. We've, we've done that based on Gram, which was developed by VBN, uh, that uh, has all the Genie AM API functions, but it also had some nice uh, functions for policy, which we're leveraging. Because as an operator of Wix, and especially when we're attaching to something that's very valuable and expensive, like a direct connect to Amazon, we can't necessarily just let anyone do that at any time. So we need to have a policy mechanism for that. So we're leveraging the whole Genie Federation and the Genie Aggregate Manager interface to do that. So you see on the right-hand side, I know it's hard to read, but basically you can come into Wix with a very familiar Genie request RSpec, and we have something we call an SDX extension. And you can ask for cross-connects on Wix in an integrated fashion with uh, you know, uh, passed across the direct connect into very specific Amazon uh, VPC resources. And typically these would be the, the customer's own VPC resources, so we don't get in the middle of the whole billing process. We're just really making the glue happen to get everything attached. So as I mentioned, policy is a very important part of this. And um, so with uh, the Gram, it has some ABAC-like policy feature statements, which allow us to discriminate about resources at the federation level, the project level, the slice, uh, the, the slice credential level, the user level. Um, on some things like bandwidth and, and VLANs. So this is a feature set that we're leveraging so we can control who has access to some of these resources. And we, kind of the idea is that at exchange points, you know, we'd like to see maybe encourage different people to bring different resources. And this could be a mechanism for people to offer up these resources as part of, uh, you know, Genie or programmatic uh, interaction to, to make things happen. So for today, um, Ali's going to go through a demo, but you'll see the Wix in the bottom right-hand side there. So this is like one component where basically, you know, flows are going to get hijacked and sent over to Amazon for some analysis. So the Wix AWS part on the bottom is something you can do through Genie uh, RSpec control now. Genie request RSpecs can be sent in and dynamically get the proper configuration on the Wix exchange point, get all that glued into Amazon and the uh, specific uh, virtual private cloud where you might have some specialized services running. And then, you know, it does all that magic behind the scenes. And there's a good bit of magic to do to make all the paths flow across Amazon. That's why you see the, the BGP instances being fired up and things like that. So with that, um, I think Ali's going to be next to go through the, the actual demo. Uh, 
as you'll see, I have a ping going on there just to make sure that connectivity is okay. We've been having some, <laughs> some issues. So I'm Ali from the GPO, and uh, this morning we want to consider the concept called service chaining. And um, for those of you who don't quite know what service uh, chaining is, we have a, a demonstration here um, on the PowerPoint. So envision a web server uh, providing a service to a web client. Okay, And now this web server, I would like to go ahead and enrich the catalog or portfolio of services provided. And so you can envision uh, the web server leveraging services at desperate sites. You could have like a, a service at site A, site B, C, or D. And so uh, you could have the web server again uh, leveraging resources at uh, site B and then site D before actually deliver, uh, delivering the end result to the destination, which is the web client. And so this morning we want to go ahead and uh, demonstrate how you could actually leverage SDN and SDX resources to uh, compose a suite of service functions for two reasons. Number one, uh, to support experimenters who'd like to go ahead and inject service functions into the experiment. And number two, to open up the avenue for exploration for experimenters who'd like to go ahead and delve a little bit deeper into the concept of network uh, service functions. And um, so this morning on the small screen, Good, I see everybody looking over there, good. So the small screen is over there, that's a live demonstration. So when I say small screen, that's a live demonstration over there. Um, I have some components there, and to orient you to the various components, we have an animated version on the big screen. Right. Okay, so on the small screen, the live demonstration, I have a gray, if you can see, a gray web, uh, web browser here, okay. So on the big screen, that corresponds to our web client in Georgia Tech, right there, which is uh, in Atlanta, okay? Now, on the small screen, I have a black web browser here that uh, corresponds to our web server on the big screen. That web server is gonna be on the big screen. That's gonna be at the GPU in Massachusetts. All right, web client, Georgia Tech, web server in Massachusetts. Now on the live demonstration, I have a red screen here. And red always means trouble, right? So the red is going to correspond to our Takas console, uh, which we have deployed right now floating in the internet. And uh, on the big screen, that corresponds to the little red Taka blob to the top there, okay? And lastly, we have our Our green screen, okay? So the green screen corresponds to the detector, which is we're running on Amazon Web Services uh, right now, okay? So the story begins, and now we're gonna look at the, the, the big screen, okay? So we have a client uh, who's doing some proprietary stuff. He has some proprietary data he'd like to upload to the web server, okay? So the web client is gonna go ahead and upload this data to the web server in Massachusetts on the animation, okay? On the small screen, we'll demonstrate uh, how this is going to happen. Okay, so we have our web client here. We're going to go ahead, and for the purposes of this demonstration, we will use uh, an image to represent this particular uh, document. So we have this proprietary image that the client is going to upload. Okay, now he has uploaded the, uh, that image to the web server. Let's take a look at our web server here. Here's our web server in Massachusetts. And let's see what we have here. Okay, great. And the document has been uploaded to our web server. All right. Now, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to consider a class of uh, security service functions. And uh, for uh, as, as a result, we'll, we'll pick one of the hot topics in cybersecurity today, which is advanced persistent threat. Okay. And we will uh, assume that the audience, we don't have much time for the demonstration, so we'll assume the audience has a basic background in what advanced persistent threat is, how it's propagated various attack vectors, and the overall objective of the attack, okay? So based on that assumption, we could jump to the important aspects of advanced persistent threat, which is relevant to this demonstration. Okay. So at our web server here on the big screen, we'll assume that the web server has been compromised, okay? 
um, again, we assume that you know how the, the, the attack vectors will be uh, uh, perpetrated. And so the web server is compromised, has a rootkit which has a backdoor to our attacker, okay? So now what we'll demonstrate is the attacker exfiltrating this particular piece of information on the big screen. The attacker is going to uh, exfiltrate this piece of information from the web server to his command and control center. Okay, on the small screen, the live demonstration, we have the attacker is going to go ahead and start his listening application. All right, so now he's listening to a connection uh, from the web server. All right, so the web server has now connected to our attacker, and so now the web server is pretty much under the control of the attacker. Now keep in mind, for advanced persistent threat, we're using advanced strategies to persist the presence of the attacker in the network, okay? And uh, the, the presence could be there from, from weeks to months to even years. I don't think we have uh, years to actually uh, watch this demonstration. So you're just going to uh, pick the important points of advanced persistent threat and demonstrate what's going to happen, all right? So at this point, we assume that the attacker has identified a particular piece of information that's useful to them on the web server. All right, so there is this uh, file here that the attacker is really interested in. So he's gonna go ahead and try to exfiltrate that data from the web server. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and attack his console and set up to receive this piece of information. So from our web server's console, Okay, so now the attacker has, or is in the process of transferring this information from the web server to his console. Okay, so let's make sure, okay, the image is actually there. And for those of you who aren't convinced, let's take a look and see what's actually in this, uh, in this piece of information. All right, so now the attacker has actually exfiltrated this image from the web uh, server at the GPU in Massachusetts to the internet. Now this is really, really bad news for any IT security team. Okay, so we want to go ahead and demonstrate how we'll enable our security service function in the experiment to detect that particular threat. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and fire up our, our detector. Okay, so now we have our detector running on Amazon uh, Web Services. So we've just injected that into our experiment. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, attempt, so this is the attacker again, trying to attempt to send this traffic from the web server to the attacker's console. But unbeknownst to the attacker, we've inserted security rules into the network such that all traffic uh, based on a particular profile is now diverted, as shown in the, the big screen, it's now diverted from the web server to the detector on Amazon Web Services. All right, so as you can see here, our detector has now detected this particular threat and it has taken action to reject that particular connection on Amazon Web Services. Now, in fact, we've also gone ahead, you can configure detector to even go ahead and send uh, an email notification. As you can see here, an email notification was also sent to the IT security team saying, hey, you know, we've detected this particular threat. Uh, so no matter where you are, Hawaii, uh, wherever you could actually get email to actually notice this particular threat. All right, uh, now so we'll, for the rest of them, uh, well, the, the, there are various modes of operation, again, for the detector. We've just used a mode where it could actually detect and reject a particular connection. Um, there is also the ability for the detector 
uh, to go ahead and inspect this traffic and based on a given profile, uh, divert that traffic if it's benign to the web client, okay? And so for the purposes of this, uh, Uh, for the purposes of this uh, conversation, we've kind of concealed the intricacies of the communication network, and we're going to focus on the PowerPoint right now. We've concealed the intricacies of the communication network, but right now we're going to demonstrate actually the various SDX and SDN drivers uh, for this demonstration. First off, we have a, a, a stitch connection over open flow between the web server and the client uh, from the GPO um, to Georgia Tech. And right now at both sites, we're supporting OpenFlow 1.3. And using the, uh, the Gini AM API, we could actually provision a connection such that uh, the connection actually is controlled by our SDN controller, um, SDN 1.3 controller. So the question is, how do we actually go about and inject this particular security service into our experiment? And this is where we leverage the uh, this is where we leverage the uh, the SDN and uh, the SDX resources of SOX and Wix. Uh, so in particular, at SOX. Um, we're leveraging OpenFlow 1.3, uh, rewriting of MAC addresses, IPs, VLANs, all this good stuff, to actually divert traffic to the Wix SDX. Now, at the Wix SDX, yeah, so at the Wix SDX right there, uh, it provides us two capabilities. Number one, it extends our experiment via layer two to the Amazon Web Services router. It also allows us to get IP traffic between the two domains, the Gini domain and the Amazon Web Services domain. Now, um, uh, for all our avid security experts out there, you realize we have two networks. The Gini network is a 10.10 .10 network. And uh, right there where the mouse pointer is there by the AWS router. And then the Amazon Web Services network is a 10.0 uh, network. And so how do we actually send traffic across those two domains? This is where we leverage uh, the BGP pairing, which the Wix SDX has established with Amazon Web Services. And so we we're simply running an instance of Quagga, uh, which uh, provides us with the, uh, the, uh, the BGP routing necessary to actually get traffic between those two domains. And so you may ask, well, how do we go about adding more services uh, to our experiment? And so you can envision having multiple uh, different services at different Gini sites. Site A has an antivirus uh, service function. Site B, site D has a, uh, site C has a next generation firewall. You can also envision like a suite of security services in the cloud. And so assuming an experimenter has what I'd call a brown uh, security policy, you can envision that security policy diverting traffic first to the cloud and then to Amazon Web Services before it gets to the destination. You could also envision another experimenter with like a blue uh, service uh, uh, security policy such that traffic is diverted uh, to sites A, sites B, and C before it actually gets to the destination. Okay. So what next? Uh, uh, right now, I mean, uh, experimenters are more than welcome to go ahead and develop their own uh, service uh, functions. Um, we're uh, supporting experimenters who like to go ahead and run experiment, uh, experiments between multiple domains. Experimenters like to go ahead and build their own SDN controllers. Uh, so if any of this uh, stuff uh, uh, excites you, uh, please uh, see me. We have the various key personnel uh, in the audience to so actually get that done for you. Thank you very much. So that went very quickly, <laughs> but I, I think it's worth, uh, well, um, Shannon and uh, the, the Renzi folks uh, come up and, and, and get set for uh, the uh, consortium update. I, I think it's worth taking a moment out to realize what an ambitious set of demonstrations you just saw. I mean, we, we saw um, you know, really a, a highly integrated set of diverse uh, software-defined exchanges. These were on different continents. These genuinely had uh, different, were from different administrative domains, including uh, different branches of the United States uh, government, Genie, uh, 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 folks in Brazil. I mean, this was, and, and oh, I'm sorry, and, and, and Amazon Web Services, you know, so a, a commercial entity. So this was, this was not a small endeavor, and it's, you know, 
the, the last slide, you know, what comes next, do that stuff. I mean, this is, there's, there's really, you know, an iceberg hiding under this tip you just saw. So it was great. Shannon, please. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, get this set up. Okay, I probably don't know most of you. My name is Shannon McKean. I'm affiliated with RENCI and with the business school at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, the uh, old well is an iconic symbol for the University of North Carolina. I think this is where I make the obligatory comment about being between you and lunch. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But what I'm going to do is bring you up to speed for those of you that aren't familiar with the, fu the Future Cyber Infrastructure Consortium, the results of a workshop that was held in October in D.C., and uh, then give you some thoughts on the next steps, which ultimately are another workshop uh, this spring for the FCIC and some focus groups we're going to hold uh, amongst interested stakeholders around the idea of what the FCIC could be. Uh, this morning, the uh, welcome address said that she had to Google Genie Engineering and understand exactly what she was doing. Um, when I told my son, who's studying engineering, that I was coming to an engineering conference, his comment was, what do you know about engineering? Not a lot. But I do know a lot about building communities uh, and managing communities. And so that's why I, I think I work well with the folks, Jay and Ilya at, at Renzi, who bring the technical side. I bring more of the management side. As I said, I'm going to talk about the background at FCIC, governance, the consortium model, member recruiting, next steps, and questions. Uh, I think, as most of you may know, um, 30 people representing 17 organizations met to discuss the future of cyber infrastructure in D.C. in October. Uh, these are all the different organizations that were there. Uh, we had a rich conversation. It was heavily Genie focused. Um, I think the vision for FCIC, it will expand beyond Genie, but right now we're speaking mainly about the Genie community. Coming out of that workshop, there was a white paper that Mark referenced in his comments. Um, the headlines of that white paper were that the, of the report will be FCIC will design, deploy, operate, sustain, and evolve an advanced distributed cyber infrastructure to support education and experimental research addressing grand challenges of society. Uh, I highlighted or put in bold sustain and evolve. I think as uh, Mark mentioned in his presentation, there's a difference between what TIPOF is going to do and what the FCIC proposes to do. And I think one of the things that you'll see coming out of this conversation is we're still unsure exactly what the delineation between those responsibilities are, but we very much look forward to having dialogue with all of you to figure out how we might go about and um, define those differences. Um, the report said that FCIC will create a cyber infrastructure environment to support multiple heterogeneous research test beds for education and research communities. Most importantly, it will be governed by and an advocate for its uh, communities. Who those communities might be, uh, it is, as I think a quote from the report, by researchers for researchers, but we believe the consortium will be valuable to many communities, some of which are listed here. Um, domain sciences, obviously, but edu and educators, obviously, but different parts of universities, commercial companies, startup companies. We hope to broaden the stakeholders that are involved in this consortium so we can truly represent the cyber infrastructure um, community going forward and help define some of the vision and the research priorities for uh, cyber infrastructure. The report talks about initial um, membership categories focused on benefits. This is straight out of the report. Um, we talked about three different member levels from participant to supporting to sustaining. I'm not going to go deep into this. It's written up in the report. But this is one way that we've talked about how we might engage different parts of the uh, community. Another way to look at it is think about the different categories of um, communities that might be involved. And one of the things that I've learned from working in a number of different consortia is it's very key to understand exactly what benefits the consortia brings to the stakeholders and what in return the consortia expects from those stakeholders. This is just something that we talked about at the last workshop um, as what 
typically these different stakeholders might want and uh, what they could bring to the consortia. This eye chart is kind of a broad governance vision of what it might look like. I've taken some uh, liberties with uh, what it might look like, but clearly it's a governance um, group that has technical communities, a membership community, and a number of different initiative committees, committees. And it's meant to work very closely with, in this case, the project office tip-off, um, with government funding, industrial funding going to the project office, but membership contributions and in-kind going to the consortia, and then a close interaction between the consortia and the tip-off. The other project office uh, in the dotted lines there is my idea. I think there is an opportunity to include power in this. And one of the things that we'll talk about in the next workshop is we hope to bring the power folks and the tip-off candidates to that workshop to hear their thoughts and involve them in uh, the conversation. Clearly, this vision has some open issues. Uh, we talked about tiered membership model. What's the right approach? Demonstrating the value to the members. Sustainability, I think, is going to be a key part of uh, what this consortia does. I think, as Ken mentioned, the idea is that tip-off and support for cyber infrastructure could break free of depending totally on NSF funding and find alternative sources. I think the power model that's out there is a terrific model and something that hopefully we can replicate with tip-off and other project offices that might be established. Uh, understanding what the committee structure membership might look like is also something we need to work on. And then clearly, what's the relationship between the project offices and the FCIC? That's an open issue. I think everybody that I've talked to is interested in hearing different perspectives. And hopefully, between now and when tip-off is announced, we can figure out exactly what that relationship might be. For the benefit of those that might not be at the workshop, one of the things we talked about, and this is some lessons that we've learned at uh, RENCI, is that generally, I think a community informs the vision and priorities, and project offices will execute. This is a two-by-two two matrix that we use at Renzi when we're thinking about consortia. Along the uh, x-axis is the number of resources required in order to pursue a particular community. And then the y-axis is the amount of coordination that's required. Uh, generally, um, I see FCIC falling more in the thought leadership quadrant and the project offices being both in the infrastructure and training operations, but somewhat close to the middle of this two-by-two two matrix. This is just a use case that we used for a data science consortium that we have at RENCI. It gives you an idea of some of the different activities that happen within the four quadrants. And this is something I hope will inform our dialogue and conversation when we um, have the next workshop. These are just some lessons that we've learned um, at RENCI about managing consortia. Uh, and I'm not going to go through them all now because back to between me being between you and lunch. But these are things that I can talk to anyone offline about. And I think one of the things I want to focus on is that a consortia, you need a full-time staff person. He or she needs to be a, reaching out to communities, involving new membership. If it's not proactive, then I think the consortia can get stale and lose its energy and momentum. And there needs to be someone who's thinking every day about how to push the consortia forward. Because the members, while they believe the consortium is important, they have day jobs, day responsibilities, and it's not a priority for them until the uh, person who's staffing it gives a call. At RENCI, we look at consortium as a five-phase phase process. Again, I'm not going to go through these, but the first workshop that was uh, hosted by the GPO and Internet 2 in Washington was the ideation phase. And I think we're entering phase two now, the formulation phase. Um, we've submitted a proposal to host a workshop at RENCI and facilitate four focus groups with different constituencies in mind for the focus groups, industry, government agencies slash labs, academic researchers, and academic IT professionals. The focus groups are going to probably be virtual focus groups. We'll explore interests, objectives, and needs of these constituencies around Genie and cyber infrastructure. Following the uh, focus group, there'll be a workshop, um, probably divided between two different topic areas kind of formation topics around what should FCIC look like, uh, clearly involving the power project office and tip-off candidates, as well as other communities, but also talk about cyber infrastructure topics, because we do want this to be an active, engaged community and find a balance between the technical side and the management side of this group. We're drafting some founding documents that will be reviewed at the workshop. 
um, including membership agreement, bylaws, and uh, we're using as benchmarks our experience at Data Science Consortium. Uh, we got some documents from Planet Lab, IROD's Consortium, and the Big Data Hubs. The planning committee listed in the proposal is here. So I think everyone is in the room. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me or Jay or Ilya. And six minutes for questions. There's got to be some questions out there. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. So I'm not doing. I'm not between you and lunch. I can take all the time in the world then. <laughs> I'm looking at Mark. Ah, Ken. We're looking at probably April or May. Um, we were a little slow in submitting the proposal, but that's that's the timing we're thinking. Rick, you have a question? No. Agreed. Ben, do you have a question? What does the kid have to be there for safety? Right. Okay. All right. Picture time. Thank you.